Thanks. Uh, before we get in here, anybody, is that true? Nobody's in Italy, actually? We're all a bunch of, we're all a bunch of foreigners here? It's foreign yeah, that may be, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I work in Munich. I work on V8 and WebAssembly. WebAssembly is actually a project that I started with uh, some people from Mozilla almost four years ago. Um, I'm a TLM, and that's a tech lead and manager. That means that not only do I actually make technical decisions about our product, but I also manage people who work on my team. So that means that I can give them raises. I can't actually take money away from them. They didn't give me that power. <laughs> uh, nobody's ever really deserved that. But, uh, can you fire them? No, it's not easy in Germany. Okay. okay, so this is entitled a little bit on the 8th web assembly. It's going to be very heavy on the web assembly. We don't have many V8 slides. Um, V8 has changed a lot since I came to talk on V8. Um, I was in this 2016 when it was in Cumberland Lodge, which I've met one or two people who are there. Jake, my um, little <laughs> brother, is coming. Um, yeah, it was, I gave a, a talk there. I think that's on YouTube. So um, I don't really have a lot of updates, but V8 has changed a lot since then. Uh, and there are many great talks out there about it that I can point to. So I'll focus more on. WebAssembly. So, just for me, my career has always been focused towards compilers. I've worked on programming languages. I actually got into research with Beyond back at Purdue. That was almost 20 years ago. That was 2001, actually. Um, it was great. We worked on Java. We had a Java virtual machine project called OpenVM, um, which I worked on. I worked with Tony Hosking a bit in uh, West Paulsburg. Did my PhD at UCLA. I went to Sun Labs where I worked Mario, so not to give you that secret. Um, <laughs> where we worked on Maxim virtual machine, and then I went to Google to work on V8. So I've done lots of uh, uh, VM stuff. So V8 is was probably the first really fast JavaScript virtual machine. It's not the only fast JavaScript virtual machine. Uh, now pretty much all JavaScript virtual machines are mature and break X speed uh, much more than it deserves as its solution is It's quite Odd from a performance perspective. <coughs> virtual machines are super interesting. There's, a, there's many PhDs left in mind out of virtual machines. So if you're curious and interested and want to go into implementation and maybe not programming like uh, analysis, there are so many things yet to be discovered. And that's why I find this area super interesting myself and why I continue to work here. <coughs> working on this topic. So let me give you some history about WebAssembly. So I joined uh, V8 in 2013. I decided to move to Germany because I love German so much, <laughs> actually. Uh, I learned, learned to speak German. Um, I'm still kind of just conversational, not exactly fluent. My blood is German, my name is German, but I'm not actually German, so in case you're uh, curious about that. So we're working on V8, and we started looking at where we wanted to go with performance, and we decided to build a new JIT compiler. And about the same time that we did that, this thing called ASM.js came out. So raise your hand if you've ever heard of ASM.js. That's about a third to a half. Okay, so ASM.js is essentially a subset of JavaScript. And being a subset, it's semantically compatible with JavaScript. Any JavaScript virtual machine can run it. But it's a subset that can be verified to be essentially fast. It's very machine level. So all the dynamic types that you would find in JavaScript actually get coerced away to you so that you have essentially just doubles and integers and memory accesses. Um, so Mozilla basically came up with this design of their own, and they foisted this upon the world um, to our chagrin in 2018. Um, and they actually had a specialized verifier for ASM.js that made it go really fast and forever. So we reacted by doing compiler optimizations Treating ASM.js more like regular JavaScript code, but you can only get so far with that. And so I worked quite a lot in, through many, many compiler analyses at this problem. Um, but we kind of realized that, that where this was going, that this weird subset of JavaScript becoming a machine code for the web, was, really wasn't tenable. So I actually started talking with Luke Wagner and Mozilla, uh, and we actually came up with the idea for WebAssembly between the two of us. Turns out it was part of his plan all along, so I, maybe I just bought into his plan. Um, in 2014, we started working towards WASM prototypes. I started working on a essentially binary parser uh, for V8. He had a binary parser for Firefox. We 
we kind of compared notes about once a week, um, did VCs and things like that. And by the time that 2015 rolled, rolled around, it became an actual project where I could get buy-in from my management to do this and other teams in Google. Um, so in about March of 2015, the NACL team at Google became involved in WebAssembly and they helped out and, and they brought us to be more of an adult project uh, with real investment from the Google side. Essentially, 2015 to 2017 is where we took WebAssembly from prototyping and the virtual machines that were available into a real production thing. Coming up with a way that people could work together in a community group, so the web is the uh, the W3C community group that we created that allowed everybody on the internet to come up with their funny ideas. Um, and also so that we could uh, build actual production systems and not just prototypes. So a lot of, a lot of uh, progress happened in just two years. I'm mostly going to talk about these, uh, this period from 2015 to, to, to now. And uh, I'll talk a bit about the future. But basically, we shipped WebAssembly by default, turn number one, in March of 2017. So that was just over two years ago. Um, and all the browsers actually had agreed to ship it at that date or to have a product that had it ready to go. Um, so Edge's release cycles are, more, are longer than Chrome and Firefox, so they will go later, but they were basically done. So then after we shipped everything, turns out there's always performance issues. There's things that we knew that we took on some technical debt by not doing something as fast as we could because we had to get it done first. And then sort of crossing the T's and dotting all the I's is part of what uh, maturity is all about. And now we're in 2019, there's lots of future features which are rolling into WebAssembly. Okay, so if you, were to, if you didn't know anything about WebAssembly, you're going to know everything from this one slide. Um, it's a low-level bytecode. It's designed to be executed it's designed to be very fast to verify this code and very fast to compile it. So we had lots of people with experience from different domains. Um, I had some JVM experience, so I knew some of the pitfalls of JVM bytecode. So we wanted to avoid those um, so that we could verify the code fast and compile it fast. Turns out that JVM bytecode has a couple of things like uh, verification that can go and do the third. Um, that's not something that you really want to have really linear time complexity for all verification. Um, one of our explicit non-goals in WebAssembly is that we didn't think interpreters mattered. And I think we're still mostly right, but not completely right about that. And the reason why is that WebAssembly is a compiler target. Compiler's going to generate this code. People aren't going to write this by hand. And it's designed to get close to the peak performance of the machine. So an interpreter might be 20 to 50 times slower than a compiler. So making an interpreter 20% faster wasn't really in the design cards. It's designed to be statically typed, so we don't have to do type inference, and we don't have to do any kind of uh, uh, type feedback analysis at runtime to figure out uh, what kind of code to generate. So all the things that would be dynamic in the dynamic language, like the types, the argument counts, whether it calls or indirect, how scopes work, and overloading and operations, none of that exists in WebAssembly. Everything is static and different. The other thing that's a little bit different than, uh, than other uh, systems for WebAssembly is that the unit of code is a little bit bigger. So the unit of code is a module. The module could be anywhere from a single function to 100,000 functions. So it's not like a class or a single file or anything like that. That's about the right scope so that you can do uh, optimizations in any module. And a uh, module actually will declare what it needs from the outside via imports and what it exports to the outside uh, via exports. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe you will talk about that later, but you said on your first, first bullet that you're almost sure you're right. Sure. Yeah. So, one thing that I've learned is that whenever you say you're explicitly not going to do this, people will come back and ask you to please do that. <laughs> um, the reason why uh, the interpreter in particular is that for debugging, it's much easier to, to use an interpreter for debugging. Um, so in V8, we actually have three execution tiers for WebAssembly. One of them is the interpreter, and that is only used for debugging. But on some platforms, 
You cannot generate machine code at runtime at all. They don't allow you to dynamically generate machine code. So you only have an interpreter. Uh, the interpreter indeed is about 100 times slower than native code. Um, so if you want to use WebAssembly, you're going to pay the big cost. But it, so, so sorry to yeah. distract, but is it because of the design of WebAssembly or just an artifact of how the interpreter is implemented? Partly both. Um, so one thing in WebAssembly that makes it difficult to interpret is that all the branches in WebAssembly are they're part of the structure control flow. We'll see this in a bit, but when you see a branch, you actually don't know where you're going until you parse the rest of the function. So once you've seen an entire function, then you can resolve where all the jumps go. They're not like in line. There's no offsets. So if you imagine an interpreter running through the code and sees a branch, it needs to have help to figure out where to go. So the way we do that in our interpreter, we have a side view so that those so that we don't have to scan forward to find where it goes. But that's one of the things. Yeah. Was um, so you have like a slightly fast verifying compiler. Was code density ever a consideration? Like the there, size of binaries? Yes, yeah, so very much. So. Platforms like that where so you can't jit, you know, it's sometimes more important to just have a decision. Yeah, so that was one of the main things actually. It had to be it's a stack machine. And that makes it much smaller, and you're going to see that in detail. Um, but also, like, it actually has high-level control flow structures, and those are actually super tiny in terms of the number of bytes. And like encoding function signatures, typically, like everything is like really down to the bytes. We optimize very carefully. And actually, all of the integers and offsets and things that show up there, they're all run-length encoded, the variable size integers, so you can see, squeeze them down to single bytes. Usually. Yeah. We talk about verification, what properties are you verifying? We need to verify the static type safety of the code and that all of the functions um, make sense and that like all the sections, there's no overlap and things like that. And there's some software fault isolation verification that happens too, right? What do you mean by that? In terms of uh, running over the memory space that's allocated? Right, yeah. So we essentially do the moral equivalent of dynamic bounds checks on the memory. We use virtual memory tricks to do that. You're going to see lots of this in, in detail. But yeah. There was one more question. That was also my question. OK. Let's go on. OK, so here we go. What does the module look like? Um, it's basically just a list of sections. Each section has a byte and tells you how long it is. And they must come in this order, actually. We discussed multiple different iterations, but it turns out that just putting them in order was actually pretty simple. Um, the big thing to note here is that the code and the data, which are the biggest part of the module, they're at the end. So all the sort of metadata, which is like what types are going to appear in the code, what the imports are, how many functions and what their types are without the bodies, like whether you have tables and how big they are, whether you have a memory and how big it is, any global variables in the exports, all that metadata comes first. So that if you imagine if you're getting these packets in over the network, which represent the module, eventually you'll get the metadata, and that's enough for you to create a representation of the module to start compilation as the, the function bodies come in. So this is absolutely designed um, with the goal of streaming compilation um, with uh, network traffic from the beginning. Yeah. You also did what that there's the possibility for multiple memories. So what's the view back? Why, why is there multiple memories? Why is it? So uh, there is space in the encoding format for multiple memories. Currently, you're limited to one. Um, but there's various things that you can do with multiple memories that would be useful. For example, you can implement an address sanitizer where you have like a memory and a shadow memory. And so they can't ever alias each other. So that's really nice. Um, and you can think about modules that maybe you want to import a memory from, from the outside, and then they have a local working space. So there's several use cases for multiple memories, but none of the engines currently could you model like heterogeneous memory spaces here to the GPU for Yeah, that's also a really good idea. Okay. All right, so now let's look at the body of the function. Okay, so we've got structured control flow. And what that means is basically you have ifs and blocks, and they must form essentially a tree. They look like essentially like a syntax tree. It's not encoded like a syntax tree, um, it's just bytes. So roughly you can think of every line as a byte in the binary encoding, and plus any of these immediates in the square brackets are also.
also additional bytes. So you can see roughly that this thing would be on the order of like maybe 15 bytes. Um, but we show a textual representation so you, so you don't have to reason about hex numbers for the point. So it's typed. Every function has a signature, which tells you the parameters and the return values. We actually allow more than one return value, um, although that is also limited to one in the engines that are uh, existent today. So it's a stack machine, which means that all values that we're going to compute with go on to an implicit operating stack. That's really good for code density, and it's really easy to generate code from like an AST-based um, producer. So there's also, we mentioned, one large flat memory that you need to access with memory instructions, so you will be stored directly from memory. There's no implicit memory operands. Um, and none of, the, none, of the, excuse me, none of the other operations actually touch the memory except for those stores. And then everything else is low-level low, low arithmetic. Um, and you just have types like 32-bit, 64-bit integers, 32-bit and 64-bit floating point numbers, and that's it. There's no object references, there's no uh, classes or anything it's really just a simple CPU machine. So it's the lowest level thing uh, you can imagine. Yeah. So you made a point of saying it has a structured control flow. Why and what's the disadvantage of that? Some people hate this app, I have to tell you. Um, but there's a really good reason why there's structured control flow. Because it makes it really easy to verify the code in a single pass. Not that it's not possible if you had direct jumps, but it makes it easier because now, in addition to the operand stack where you push your abstract values and their types, you also have an abstract control stack. And the control, control stack is actually the minimum amount of information that you need to keep to verify the code as you go through the control flow. And that also holds for JIT compilation too. So you imagine if you have some per, per block state that you need to keep in your JIT, as soon as you as you've finished like the nested control flow in a region, you're done with that and throw away the state. The other reason is that it actually makes the engine simpler too. Because structured control flow means that there's no, that there's no irreducible loops in the code. Um, so there are algorithms for register allocation, for code generation that are much simpler if you don't have to deal with irreducible loops. And those are just by design and impossible. So what's the disadvantage? What's the disadvantage? So if you start with a control flow graph, then you have to turn it into structured control. And there are a couple ways to do this. Um, you can start by essentially putting your basic blocks in a post order um, using a normal post order graph, graph traversal. And then you insert blocks whenever you have, so you need to put blocks around, um, uh, excuse me. Let me think of it this way. When you declare a block, you're actually forward declaring a label that you can jump to. Because you can actually only break out of a block. So you have to forward declare that as high as all the places that it can be used. So you find the common dom uh, dominator and place it there. And that's what the that's what the back end and the client does and the whole end. Another way to do that is to just build the dominator tree from the control flow graph and traverse it and actually match the control structures and output ifs and elses and things like that. But if you start with an EST, you don't have to do any of that. So it means that a control flow based compiler has to do a little bit of work to put in this format. So, yeah. Just that, I guess one comment on the client thing, like after the fact that we did that, we saw that as a mistake, we tried to fix that with Swift with SIL. Um, just because we didn't feel like we had enough encoded and it was like we were generating our intermediate form. Um, but like one question, maybe cover this, and I'm sorry if I missed it, uh, exceptions. Do you have a program for that or do that, do you kind of lower it and all that just user? So uh, you do need to have a new set of bytecodes for exceptions, um, and there's a proposal which we've actually implemented in the prototype. And you basically have try catch, so you will have. This is where it's great to have structured control yeah. flows, because then try catch it becomes explicit. You have a range where the try is and a place where the catch is, and then they just nest properly. Everything just works out. It looks like an ESP, um, and then you have to deal with throwing and throwing and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so if you don't have the status right now, what happens on internal things like if you by zero? Uh, so okay. if you if you divide by zero, that's called a trap, which is okay. an exception. Um, you actually do get an exception at the JavaScript level. We produce yeah. Java. Okay. Yeah. So um, WebAssembly can be embedded into other things, and the most common embedding is JavaScript. 
When that happens, you get a traffic web assembly, you get a JavaScript exception, which is thrown, you get a stack trace, and it looks just like a JS exception. Okay. All right, so what is in a WASP engine? What do you have to, what do you have to do to build one of these things? So the requirements are, obviously, you have to load and validate the WASP bytecode somehow. Um, you have some representation of that module in memory, which is more, more uh, convenient than dealing with individual bytes, so that metadata representation. And then you've got to have an execution engine uh, in what we would call the tier because there are multiple levels of them. We get into those. So you either need to compile or interpret the WASM like. Obviously, WASM is designed to be close to the machine, so it makes the most sense to compile it. But if your WASM engine and you just integrate into an embedding such as JavaScript, you need to have implement an API uh, that allows JavaScript to create and run WebAssembly and WebAssembly to call JavaScript. Um, and then all these things actually do have memory associated with them. Not only the WebAssembly memory, which is this giant byte array, uh, but all those internal data structures. So there's going to be some of that in there too. And then it turns out that people want to debug their programs because they can't get them right for some reason. Um, so you want, to, you want the engine to help them. So being able to stop, set breakpoints, see the internals of the, the execution stack and operating stacks. You need some debugging facilities. And then garbage collection. And that's mostly because the embedding with JavaScript, at least in the case, the case of V8, um, is garbage collected and these things can escape to the outside world and they can uncontrollably be referenced. So I'm going to mostly talk about uh, the compilation tiers. And compilers are awesome. I spent my entire research career and professional career working on them. Um, and they're so much fun. They can just fill your brain with graph problems. <laughs> their WebAssembly has this goal of being very fast. It was designed from the beginning to get as much as possible out of the machine in a safe way, a portable way. Um, and that requires you to do some compiler science. So, but it also should be predictable in the sense that it shouldn't take a lot of dynamic analysis and a lot of tight feedback information from running to be able to get to that uh, high performance. That also means that everything is predictable in the sense that you can't do something slightly wrong and then get a huge slowdown. You don't want to be 10 times slower because you put your local variable in the wrong place or something like that. Um, that can happen in JavaScript, but we don't want that in WebAssembly. And our goal from the beginning is that we, we should get really close to what the native machine can do, which means that if you took C and compiled it to machine code versus taking C and compiling it to WASM and running it through an engine, those should be within about 20%. And I think we mostly got there. Um, we have benchmarks to prove it, and also benchmarks that show us whether we failed at that. So this was actually probably, this would have been really difficult if we started off and everybody was like, all right, let's do it, let's build a new optimized compiler from scratch, it would have delayed this whole thing probably by two years. So we cheated. So we used the, the, the JITs that we already had. In V8, we already had TurboFan, which we had designed and built to, to run JavaScript fast. Um, and we actually used that AOT mode at the beginning. Um, I just mentioned that because I'm going to talk about how we changed that tiering strategy. SpiderMonkey also had an optimizing JIT, which they used for their JIT, for their JS execution. And they were very much on the, on the on par with us. So they just reused that. JSC, who's got like a trillion compilers inside, they used one of theirs. And Edge already had two execution tiers that they uh, used. So essentially all the engines already had this wonderful set of parts that you could use to get WebAssembly up to speed without them. Uh, can you explain the acronym AOT? AOT means ahead of time, which is used to mean compile. <laughs> Before there was JIS, there was compile. <laughs> so yeah, AOT is something which has been introduced. No, I really mean compile. <laughs> okay, what sucks about compilers is that they take time. Unfortunately, there's no infinitely fast compiler, so you're always going to pay something. Um, so you're going to either pay a startup time, or a runtime, or a combination of both. And uh, you really want to have fast startup too. You want to have like your 
cake and eat it too. Um, you don't want to spend like 10 seconds compiling a module. That really sucks. Um, people are not going to go to a web page and sit there and watch some spinner for eight seconds every time. Um, that might work for video games, but not for the, the web at large. So when you use an optimizer compiler, it builds intermediate representations, it does register allocation. You're not getting to 20% to within 20% of the native code speed without doing those things. But that takes time. And TurboFan is a pretty heavyweight optimizer compiler, but it's not terrible for uh, compiler performance. It's in the 1 to 1.3 megabyte a second range. This is what we measured on a single thread. And the reason why is we have to do all those things. But the implication of all that is, is that very medium-sized module, we would consider a medium-sized module, uh, 10 megabytes, it takes eight seconds in a single thread. And that's just unacceptable. Yeah. What C of node ER? Aha, uh -huh. okay, so you're making me write all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so IR stands for intermediate representation, which is the what the internal graph or tree or other data structures that your compiler uses. So the intermediate representation of the code. C of nodes is a dependency-based representation where everything really is just a graph of nodes and all the edges describe the dependencies. It's a little bit more advanced than a control flow graph. It has advantages and disadvantages. Um, you'll find a similar thing in the, in the, uh, in the uh, Graal compiler and, you, and a similar thing in the Hotspot server JIT. And there are a few other systems out there. So it's a little bit different than a control flow graph. There is kind of a control flow graph embedded inside, but there's lots more other interesting edges. Okay. So, you know, like when we shipped uh, the very first version of WebAssembly and, you know, before we even got to production, people would come to us and, and they would notice our comp compilation pauses that were caused by this AOT strategy. And they say, fix that, please, just do something <laughs> better, make it better. And, and so we went down that road, we analyzed the different phases of compilation and how can we make it faster. One of the easiest ways to make a compiler faster is to make it compile less stuff. Uh, so what we did there is we noticed that um, the way we compiled bounds checks, we typically had a little cluster of nodes, about five nodes, that were essentially always the same. So you just kind of cheat a little bit, even though it's beautiful in the, in the sea of nodes to have everything boiled down to the basics. We cheated a little bit, made some macro nodes um, so that it had Know, essentially 30% smaller graphs, um, and then those were those just sail right on through the compiler, mostly not, mostly doesn't look at it anymore, and then the, the back end actually had to implement every one of those. So it was more work in the back end, but it saved a ton of graph space, and that's that was worth 30% of the overall compile time. And it was kind of worth it, even though me as a compiler person, it always made me feel bad to add things that were, that were need to be implemented in the back end, um, but it was totally worth it from a compiler uh, performance perspective. So then people are like, okay, great, give us more of that trap lift stuff. Let's make it 10x faster than using that. And that's just not going to happen. And it, you can see why if you break down the compilation time. Okay, so you've got to build a graph. So you've got to parse the bytecode and build the nodes. That was about 10% of the overall compilation time. So maybe you can make that 2x faster get 5% of compilation time, okay, great. So then maybe you can have 5% of optimization, you can't really say much more there, maybe you can say 1% or 2%. Um, then you can maybe improve the scheduler, maybe not do scheduling, maybe you could skip the scheduling pass altogether. Um, but then you actually have to select instructions, you have to look at the nodes again, and then once you've selected instructions, you've got to allocate registers for so maybe you could have a dumber register allocator. Uh, and then code generation, really not going to get much more there. So even like our estimates of looking at all the phases and all what we could possibly say is maybe another 30%. So this is not a doubling of the, the, the compilation speed. This is not 10x. This is not going to solve the problem if we have eight second pauses. So then the next thing, people are like, hey, use the threads, man. 
<laughs> so yeah, we've got lots of cores of all these machines. So that's actually this an embarrassingly parallel problem, which is wonderful. Um, so we can just use as many threads as possible, um, and that's what we did. So on an eight-core machine, basically, this is like I'm papering over tons of refactoring to make the compilation like actually run on multiple threads. Um, but basically, an almost linear speed up on an eight-core machine. There's some overhead because they are competing for internal resources and things like that. <laughs> and um, but that now means that with the previous improvements and this parallelization, we're now down to about one and a half seconds for that same 10 megabyte module. And now we're kind of already in the sort of usable zone, even though people always want things to be infinitely fast. So the next thing is, okay, so now we're down to one and a half seconds. It seems like we're getting to the intrinsic amount of work that we need to do. Maybe we can just hide it so you can't see it. Um, so that was actually designed for in the API that we gave to JavaScript. So in addition to be able, being able to synchronously load and compile the module, you can now asynchronously compile the module. So you basically give it the bytes and say, please compile this and tell me when you're done. Um, that call there in blue, webassembly.compile, that gives you a promise. And then you can chain behavior to the end of the promise. And then you can go off and keep doing your UI stuff. You can do responsive to user events. The compilation happens in the background, and, and it's free. Um, so we, this was totally designed for, we implemented the API, even though it was technically, it was technically using synchronous compilation under the hood until we finally shipped the async implementation um, about a month after the, the, the uh, our, our, our public release. Uh, Turns out that doing all these asynchronous things in a multi-threaded environment is tricky. And we had to fun, fix several bugs there. We didn't finally get this state license until November. But that means that now, this 1.5 seconds, now gets moved into the background. Some of the work actually has to happen up front. So there's some unavoidable work that we need to create and manage this asynchronous compilation. And so that would be the pause that you get initially. And we actually had some small pauses because there was some interaction with, uh, with the main thread um, because of V8's Keep, um, but those were very small, like three millisecond pauses, so you mostly wouldn't see those. So now we've gone from originally eight seconds to one and a half seconds to now 150 millisecond initial pause and then finishing with only small pauses. Yeah? Oh, what are you saying? Uh, 150 milliseconds? It's from what time? Because if, if you want to just run the code immediately, you still have to wait for yeah. five seconds. Right, so this, this would be. The, essentially, the cost of that okay. directly is 150 milliseconds, and then it may be still one and a half seconds later, but you're doing asynchronous work. All right, so can we go? Can we make this even better? So can we hide the latency even more? And actually, we also thought about this and designed for this in the API. Um, in 2017, this wasn't part of the initial API, but a streaming API, where instead of passing the bytes, actually you could pass a URL, or uh, actually a, fe a fetch response. So now you could do a res you could do a fetch to uh, to some server, and the response, which is not yet finished, which is streaming the bytes in, is kind of coming in asynchronously. You could go ahead and feed that to the WebAssembly API. So now the bytes are coming in on the network, and we're already starting. To This is the API is for jobs. Oh, sure. So is there any reason to not use the file streaming? Sorry? Is there any reason to not use the file streaming? Uh, you might not actually be getting the bytes from the network. You may have uh, created it yourself. Okay. And then you're kind of already done. Okay. So you said that the unit of compilation was the module. Yes. But if you're streaming, you would you be able to optimize across functions you have received? Correct. So that would be one reason not to use it. Yes. Okay, so that API was added in uh, 2017 and we finished that at the end of 2017. And now, except it's actually a question of throughput, it's no longer about latency, because essentially all the latency 
it has to do with getting the bytes from the network. The question is, can you keep up with the network? And uh, how many threads do you need to do it? And our measurements were that even with TurboFan and its full optimization settings, if we had eight threads cranking, we could keep up with a 50 megabit uh, network connection, which means however large your module is, we would be done with the module essentially right after you finished it. Yeah. So, um, does VA compile JavaScript? Does it manage to compile JavaScript is like, like this? We do uh, much of the same kinds of things for JavaScript, um, but there are, there are reasons why we don't do this for an entire script. Um, so, JavaScript, we found that much of, much of a big script is not executed, so we're very lazy about compiling uh, functions. And actually, compiling functions nowadays in V8 means generating bytecode from them, from the AST. So that's cheaper than going through a full optimized compile. So there's different trade-offs. We can do much of that asynchronously. We can do some of that streaming, um, but not what we did. Yeah. Well, how good would it be if you were to compile your JavaScript to was your How easy would it be? Or? Well, how good the code quality would be? I think it would be pretty terrible. Because JavaScript needs lots of dynamic optimization to do, to do well. And you need to really be very speculative. Okay, so back to this question. Can you make the compiler faster? And yeah, actually you can. Just start a program from scratch and do another, do another one that doesn't use an IR, that doesn't do any of the optimizations. All you care about is making the compiler fast. You can make a completely different set of trade-offs. And that's what we did. It's actually, we're not the first people to do this. Um, we call ours liftoff, kind of keeping with the whole ignition, V8, turbofan uh, naming convention. And we did a prototype of this and comparing this to turbofan. Uh, this compiler basically just goes through the WebAssembly bytes and outputs machine code. And that's about 10 to 20 times faster going through all the regular role of generating an IR and trying to allocate registers. So, this is what we came up with. It's actually pretty straightforward. In fact, like, some of the first compilers that were ever built that used just AST walking co-generation techniques, it's very reminiscent of that, so it's not that we uh, invented something groundbreaking, um, but it's actually pretty smart. Uh, it just walks over the bytes, and for every instruction, we're going to generate code. And for some instructions, um, we don't need to generate code. Maybe we can make some little tweaks to some side tables. And I'm going to show you that in details. In detail. Um, one thing that's important actually turns out that allocating registers, even though it seems like a performance optimization, that actually helps compile time too, because you generate less machine code. But you don't need to try really hard to avoid all the spills. Um, so an on-the-fly on the register allocator and the, in a single pass, as you go along, actually totally pays for itself. To make this, uh, since we're building a new compiler from scratch, all the way down to the machine code, we're very cognizant of what the cost is to maintain that in multiple platforms. V8, had, V8 is now down from its peak of 11 uh, machine code targets to 8, um, but still that's a lot of work to write the back end for every one of these. So we did think carefully about how to share as much of the, the logic of that compiler um, in, a, in a portable way, and then only have like the little snippets of a mini machine code um, be per platform. Okay, so, so then, yeah. What is the difference roughly in the policy that generates machine code performance wise? I'm going to show that, okay. but uh, let's say 50%. Okay. Somewhere between 50% and 2x. Okay. okay, so. I'm going to need to use my fingers for this diagram because I'm going to take laser pointer. Okay, so there's one little thing. Let me do that. Let me do that actually. Well, I've actually done a lot, so let's see. <laughs> How does this thing work? There we go. Okay. Okay, so we're going to keep some abstract state as we go along. Um, there are things that we're going to keep track of. We're going to keep track of the control stack. That's going to keep blocks. Um, those correspond to the control flow blocks, if, then, else, and end. 
And there's an implicit block around the function that's going to be zero. This control stack is actually going to go through to the left. And then there's going to be an operand stack. There's going to be operand, uh, sorry, locals. And the abstract state of a local or operand stack spot is going to be one of these thingies, which is either it's not in register, it's filled. It is in a register and which one, because it can only be one register, or it's actually a small constant. So we actually track small constants because we can generate um, like add intermediates and things like that. Those are those are faster and smaller than, than pushing constants into the stack. Okay, so start out. And because of the signature, we actually know what's going to be in locals that correspond to those arguments. Um, they, there's a calling convention, so we know the first argument comes in EAX, second one in EDX. There's an initial block, and then there's going to be, for every instruction, we're going to do three different things. One of them is to do with control, one of them is to do with data flow, and then one of them is actually to make code. So we start out, we have, we have to admit the, uh, we have to initialize the first control block, we initialize the locals for the first parameters, and then we actually emit some code to set up the frame. All right, so the very first instruction we see actually doesn't generate any code at all. Um, we're just going to manipulate the abstract stack. So this loads a local variable onto the operand stack, so it's local zero, and that just means we're going to take local zero, the, rec, uh, the abstract value which is there, and then we're going to copy it onto the operand stack. There's no code control flow involved, so we don't have to mess with the control flow stack. And there's no code to be generated here. So that's pretty easy. So we move forward. Okay, now we actually have an instruction which deals with control flow as an if. Um, so we're going to push an if onto the control stack um, so to keep track of it. And actually, an if is a, is a conditional instruction, so it needs to actually use a value from the top of the operating stack. So we pop that guy off. Uh, and now we're going to actually generate code uh, in a, a conditional jump, and the condition is going to be EAX. So we get to do all three of the nice colored arrows for this instruction. We get to another get local, and we're going to do what we did before. Yeah. Uh, when you're doing the F, yeah. where do you jump? When you hit code? We don't know where we're going to jump yet. Okay. So what do you admit? Do you use the name of the language? Yeah, we admit without known target yet, and we'll patch it later. And that's why this is going to be on the stack, because when we finally pop that thing off the stack, we're actually going to have a list of all the branches that go to it, and then patch them. And then actually, when we're done with that, we'll never be able to do anything with that. So it may not be such a big deal that we don't have to keep metadata for every block on the whole function, um, but it does mean that we only have to keep metadata for, for the depth of the control stack. So it's a little bit more efficient Okay, so get local, we saw that before, we did the same thing. Okay, now we hit a load, and same thing, it's not a control instruction, so there's nothing to do with the control stack. Uh, we just have to pop the index off the top of the stack, we need a new register for the result, and we need to admit the code, and then we go on. Alright, so, you can kind of imagine, I'm not going to show you the details of all this, it'd be super boring. Um, but you get to an else, and now that's like, that's a place where you would jump. That matches the if, and that's where you get patch all the jumps to. Okay, so, what does that mean? When you finally get down to it, um, the prototype is 10x faster, 10 to 20x faster, but then when you get all the things done, actually, you have to implement some more stuff that you didn't implement in the prototype, but you still get about a 5x gain out of this, and that's totally worth it. And you pay about 50% in the code quality. So this is actually a graph over time. Um, this is, it goes down little by little because uh, as the way we, we incrementally uh, implemented this, you implement another bytecode and then now you're able to compile functions that have that bytecode. If you haven't implemented that function, you just bail out to the other compiler. So you can ship a compiler incrementally this way in you know, two tiers. Yeah. So, so, but it seemed to us that your startup time was good at the end of your efforts. So why? It's never good enough. <laughs> that was for 10 megabytes. 
What you mentioned is medium size. Now we're seeing 50 megabyte modules. And people just magically expect this to work. So, yeah. Question? Yeah. So, if I target web assembly now, am I expected to perform the optimizations that V8 did on CMOs? Or, because you, you lose, or it seems like you ditch all the optimization things that you had in the CMOs approach. Yeah, liftoff doesn't do any of that, right? So, so the goal is to like, port these to, to liftoff? No, I'll show you. Even better. We get the best of both worlds without doing that much work. Okay, so the answer is theory. Does anybody speak German? I know a few of you do. Okay, you'll get the play on words here. Okay, so theory is all about, now we have two different ways to execute code, and they have radically different performance trade-offs. One is 5x faster to generate, but it's a little bit slower. One is 5 times uh, slower to generate, but it runs at maximum speed. And how can you combine them to get maximum benefit? And the answer is magic, theory. So we're going to balance compilation. I'm going to stop using this, actually. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we're going to use tiering as a strategy to get the be best of both worlds. We want, you generally want to use the faster compiler at startup so you can get going really fast, and then you eventually want to use the better compiler so that your code runs at, at its maximum speed. And we actually have a third tier, which is an interpreter, which I mentioned before, because Jan uh, poked me and asked me about it. Um, that actually we designed only for debugging. I mentioned before it's about a hundred times slower than native code. We actually did an experiment to see whether it would be worth it to try to use the interpreter as one of our production tiers. It turns out it's not because A, we have to verify the code anyway, and B, liftoff is so fast that it's almost as fast as just verifying the code alone. So it turns out it would be faster to just generate code from liftoff and run it than try to bother with this interpreter. Although it would save memory. An interpreter would say it could. Um, but yeah, we decided to trade off that we didn't want to go, go in that direction. So now there's lots of different possibilities for exactly how you're going to make these compilers work together. Um, and we identified four, four kind of main strategies that we looked at, and I'm going to go through them in detail. And I'm going to have to use that infernal pointer again. Um, but basically, one is to just AOT everything with the fast compiler. That guarantees you that everything is compiled before you start running, so you're never going to have to wait to get code for a function. But tear up in the background. So use the optimizing compiler in the background so that eventually everything will eventually get its hottest, uh, fastest version and you'll be up to peak speed. Um, another way to do that is that you AOT everything from the beginning and you only tear up the things that are hot. And to do that, you need to actually know which things are hot and you need to implement some kind of profile. So that was actually more work to do it that way. But it's one way that you could do it. And then there's a couple of other strategies that we didn't explore too much. Um, and I will explain them in detail. Um, but maybe actually you don't need to compile the entire module up front because nothing is cheaper than not doing any work at all. But the problem is that you get some potential for pauses. And then you can decide, uh, again, whether you will Compile stuff in the background and how we will dynamically tear up. So there's a couple of different orthogonal axes here. Okay, so this is the first one, number one. Okay, so let me explain this here. This is the main thread of execution on the left. Uh, the blue is compiling and instantiating. That's essentially the start of pause uh, of getting a module and getting it to run. So the lighter green color is the idea that those, that's execution time in unoptimized code. And then the darker green color is optimized code. So you can kind of see this strategy. What we're doing is we're using background threads to compile everything with liftoff. This lighter, uh, this pink color is liftoff compilation. And then once that's finished, then we're ready to get going and running. And then we, in the background, using one less thread so that we don't compete with this actual main thread, we will do the background compilation with the optimizing code. And then the idea is that eventually the optimizing compiler is going to be finished, and at some point you're going to be in a stable uh, performance regime where you're only running optimized code. So the advantages of this scheme is that you'll, 
we have a very short startup pause because we throw everything at the baseline compiler to get done. There's no jank, so you never have to wait for code. So you'll never have a pause due to waiting for the compiler. But the problem is, there's always a trade-off here. You compile everything twice, like everything twice. And that actually uses more than double the amount of code space because the unoptimized code is a little bit more than the optimized code, like maybe 50%. So you end up paying 2.5x the memory and actually do all the work for all the things. Question? Uh, you said one of the optimizations of the pure plan based compiler was that you could uh, compile what you were loading the code. Yeah. Uh, this approach is throwing that way, right? No. Actually, this is actually streaming too. We, we stream and compile with the base. So it, does, it actually doesn't matter which tier you use. That's the the streaming is Yeah. Uh, so I guess because JavaScript, well, I mean, V8 compiling JavaScript, you will sometimes be optimized back to the uh, Now, so I think this one, compiling JavaScript, you never get optimized. Correct. Okay. Yeah. That also means that you maybe get stuck in a loop in unoptimized code, because we don't actually don't do it that far, <coughs> but you're really not even supposed to get stuck in loops on the web because the stupid main thread is the UI thread thing. Um, so we actually don't see that. In yeah. Uh, so in the original question, if you have JavaScript running at the same time, uh, where do you compile the JavaScript? Do you stop compiling JavaScript one at a time? Yeah, so optimizing JavaScript is a, is a complicated uh, question, but JavaScript execution is going to be part of this. It's going to be interleaved because WASM and JavaScript call each other all in the same thread. We do uh, some background bytecode generation, so that the moral equivalent of liftoff, but for JavaScript. And we do some background compilation with TurboFan for JavaScript. So both of those things can happen in the background. And for JavaScript, both of those things can happen in the foreground, too. So you can get compilation time jank uh, for JavaScript, but not for those. OK, my question is more um, the threads that you use for combining with ASM, they are the same threads as for JavaScript. Yes. Yeah, actually, it's even more complicated than that. So V8 doesn't allocate its own threads. V8 actually uses the embedder threads, and the embedder is Chrome. And Chrome has its own operating system scale scheduler of all the stuff that it does, and good network and all the stuff. So we just ask, hey, we actually just tell them, here's some background work, please go do it and schedule it. But yeah, it's all the same threads. All right, so next strategy, next tier up. Uh, strategy number two. Okay, so we have the same picture on the left. This is the main thread. Uh, this is the what represents the startup pause, and this is the execution. These little red dots are triggerings of optim uh, uh, excuse me of the uh, optimized compiler using whatever mechanism that you imagine, whether that's um, whether that's like sample based or whether that's counter based. It doesn't matter. Uh, but the the idea is to illustrate that okay, we've got the same AOT with liftoff. Here, it's the same picture we saw before, but there's much less compilation work happening here because it's only triggered by uh, proof of What that means is that uh, the warm-up phase is going to be much longer because we have to wait until these things have been executed long enough. We essentially have to waste time executing the unoptimized code before we even know what to compile. Um, that means that the stable phase may be much, much later. Eventually, you will compile everything if it gets hot enough, um, but you actually don't know when that's going to be. You don't actually have pauses, so that's great. Um, and you still get the same uh, short startup pause with no jank. You get less overall compiler work, but the main disadvantage is vulnerable. Yeah, so weird question. So is that second error there for the uh, turbo fan compilation? This one? The, oh, okay. The one between the two. Yeah. Sorry, this one. Uh, the one on the next one, then. So to me, it doesn't quite end up with the TurboFan function there. Because it's this one. So, okay, so it goes back to the second. I was just wondering if that was like, because sometimes this doesn't pay off, or like to the darker green areas, it's, it's just whatever. Oh, you mean this? Like, yeah. <coughs> so it's like, oh. Yeah, and maybe so that you can finish that function. Maybe it's just, okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you don't have to work, you just, but you yeah. just kind of mix up. Yeah, actually, the way it works, um, we just install the code, so, and, and we actually do that asynchronously, and just like patch the code into a table, and it'll get picked up. Cool. Yeah. 
But we don't actually do that with SAR to minimize the yeah. Can you discard that lift out uh, to run for it? We can do that now, it's in the prototype. Okay. Yes. And that's actually more complexity in the system, yes. Could you imagine the uh, WASM format coming with a compile schedule? Absolutely. That's it. what we implemented in the last three months. <laughs> we, had a, we had an intern who actually just finished a prototype of that, and we we're going to make a proposal for a section that has combination things. So yes, very good idea. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Would you be able to reach around the point about 10 minutes? Sorry? It was still in a long period of time today. I didn't understand that. Would you be able to reach around the point about 10 minutes? Yeah, my overtime. No, we ate your timing. But we could, we could sleep, right? Wow, that is the sleep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 10 minutes? Yeah, I can totally do 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, Alright, so another way is like, let's just not do anything. Like, why do anything up front? If you want to get going fast, let's just go. And then we'll just wait until we hit, hit the stuff that you need. Okay, obviously, this is going to give you the shortest uh, startup time pause because it's zero work. Well, effectively, zero work is what someone to do. Um, but the main thing is that you have to wait for code at some point. You hit the code, you have to wait for the compiler to finish. And if you, hit, if you do that too much, maybe you actually jank it and lose frames. And that's always been a problem for JavaScript, it's a problem for garbage collection. And generally, jank you want to. So that's the main uh, disadvantage. But that's really awesome for startup time. And it's also uh, awesome for the overall pilot work uh, because you, do, you only essentially do the work that's necessary um, and you save a lot of memory too. So this maybe actually makes sense in different areas where maybe uh, the, the startup doesn't actually hit very many functions. Um, maybe you could actually hybridize this before um, where this is where Jan asked that maybe you can actually do a hybrid of this too. Um, another way to slice this uh, cat, skin this cat, um, is that actually maybe you don't do any of the startup time pause, but in the background you compile the liftoff. So you essentially are now moving the execution time to before liftoff finishing, and maybe you can throw in for good measure some uh, turbofan compilations. That's slightly better than before. Because you will actually, at some point when liftoff finishes, you'll be done with jank. There'll be no jank after that. Um, um, so it's kind of just an upgraded version of the previous one. And actually, I have a slide for what Jan is. Um, the bonus number five is actually what the intern implemented over the summer. And that's where there's actually a hint section that tells you what to compile up, up front, which tier you want, whether you uh, whether you think it's going to be hot and such. Um, we think this is actually the, the best of all possible worlds if the hit section is uh, not pathological. So you could imagine that maybe you decide that all the cold code needs to be optimized up front and they can't start. Terrible idea, but the, the hit section could say that and they would, they would suffer the consequences. But now you can do this, like you AOT all the things as requested and then it even tells you whether things should be optimized and like when. Um, and then this, this has the advantage that eventually, eventually uh, you will reach peak performance and uh, you will not waste any work getting there. So this is what all that looks like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But by hand to me, basically it comes with the code. Yeah. Um, so how large of a size of code would it be? So the hint section is actually pretty small. It's actually a separate section from the code. Um, so that, so it's like you can ignore that section. It's totally semantically invisible, other than the performance. And it's like you know, you say this range of functions gets this tier, that tier, and it's like really small compared to the actual code. It's small. All right. So we did all this work. It was a lot of engineering work. This is basically what I spent my life on the past three years. Besides WebAssembly, new features and things like that. Um, but this is what my team did. Uh, Parallel was the first thing that we did because that was like actually way easier um, than any of the other things and the biggest bang for the buck other than uh, liftoff. Um, and then we did asynchronous and streaming in the baseline tier. Uh, and then actually, once you have the baseline tier, you kind of 
aren't going anywhere unless you, <clears throat> excuse me, have the, the tiering strategy. Uh, the compilation hint thing is a prototype that we've finished now, um, and it won't be turned on until we actually standardize that section. Um, but, so someone asked about freeing the code. Um, we actually now have a prototype of this, which is running. Uh, we experiment on our users, so maybe some of you actually have, about 1% of you out there probably have this turned on. Um, this is actually pretty tricky because you have to know when the code is dead across multiple threads, and you actually essentially have implemented garbage collector. Um, and that's what we did. We wrote a custom garbage collector um, specifically for the code. Um, one thing that actually maybe doesn't even factor in when you think about this is that actually JITs are a kind of security problem. I don't know if you noticed this. Um, <laughs> but they have this giant write space where it's also executable. And then if an attacker gets any out-of-bounds write, they can write their machine code that they want and just execute it. So for JavaScript, our strategy has been we actually never have pages that are both writable and executable at the same time. So whenever the JIT runs, it generates code into something that's writable. And then it actually quiesces JavaScript, flips, flips the uh, permissions, and then allows JavaScript to run again. So JavaScript never runs concurrently with the code uh, that's being patched and generated by the JIT. That's not the same, that's not true for WebAssembly. And the reason why is that we do all this background compilation and we do dynamic tier up in the background, is it was just too hard to, for us to get there. Um, so we had to get those performance features first at the cost of a giant security hole. <laughs> and uh, we've actually been part of the exploit chain, even though the WASM JIT in the WASM format did not have any security bugs. There was another security bug in V8 which gave somebody a write, and they found the WebAssembly code memory and they went and wrote their code in there. <laughs> um, so that's what happens. Now we're working on actually making this absolutely robust um, and moving the JIT completely out of the process. So you actually never can write the executable code. Uh, and it can be, it can be dy dynamically concurrently patched from the other process, which you don't even ever see. So this is something that we're starting now. It will probably take two quarters to get that done. Um, but we'll patch this vulnerability, which is potentially there. Yeah. Cool. It's like tremendous work. Can I ask, like, how does your team or contributor size like, fluctuate over the years? Uh, we grow by one person every 18 months. Okay. <laughs> it started with just me, and then added a person after 18 months. <laughs> we're now at six, including me. And actually, the speeding up a bit, we'll probably get another person. So we. That's yeah. just the Google side? That's just the, that's the uh, WebAssembly runtime team, my okay. team. We have a whole other team of people that work on Clang, the generate WebAssembly. Yeah. And there's another team of people that work on standards. WebAssembly, of course, we work closely with both of them. Um, but yeah, just the runtime team is. Wow, that's awesome. Okay. And yeah, so. There's lots of stuff that happens behind the scenes. Like, it's not just writing new code and shipping new code. Like, we constantly deal with what we call te technical debt or refactoring. So that means we've had to change the engine in many different ways. So, in the beginning, actually, the WASM code was specialized to an instance. The instance is like the memory and the tables and, and the uh, sort of the the, uh, the runtime data. Of your we used to actually smash in constants for where does the memory start and how big is, it, big is it into the machine code. That means that you can't share that machine code across multiple instances. We believe, and I believe, I did it, I was an idiot. Um, <laughs> we believe that that would make the code faster. And actually, factoring all those code specializations out, we were able to do that with essentially no performance regression and be able to now share the code, cache the code on disk, and not have to patch it. That was a ton of work to undo one of my bad ideas, and we had to do it. I know there's a lot of stories like that. Um, what I learned from that is that actually you have to be ready for change, and you don't actually know uh, for how things should work. Anyway, but just a preview of other things that we had to change, uh, and other things that we had to bring into existence. Making V8 and Chrome be able to deal with getting signals for touching memory you shouldn't touch. So in WebAssembly, we have this big memory, which is maximum four gigs in size. Uh, user pointers are 32 bits. 
so they can go maximum four gigs out of bounds off the end. So you just map eight gigs of memory on a 64 bit, uh, eight gigs of address space on a 64 bit machine. Just map out all the things that are out of bounds, and you just don't even compile a bounds check. The compiler work was done in a matter of weeks. Uh, the actual shipping that damn signal handler in Chrome took like six months, or maybe a year. Actually, it's more like two years. Uh, and that's mostly because trap handlers are hard on a bunch of different uh, platforms. And you don't, you totally don't see that. Like a research prototype, um, you don't see that. But in a production system, uh, that's kind of a pain. All the runtime data structures that we use, some of them are off of the heat heap, so they're not garbage collected, not traced. Um, and some of them need to be on the heap because they're tied to JavaScript. So like going back and forth with these things and making sure you don't have a memory leak and making sure you don't have a double free. That's all, that's a lot of work. Initially, so, so for JavaScript, V8 actually allocates all of its compiled code onto the heap. And so compiled code in JavaScript has many references to other objects and things like that. And just, the GC just traces through like other objects. It doesn't care. There's special pages of memory that are executable, but they're really just garbage collected objects. Um, that's how I initially implemented RASM compilation, because it was it's not disturbing the system, it just used the garbage collected heap objects, uh, code objects, no problem. Uh, that doesn't work when you have multi threaded uh, garbage collection, or when you don't have multi threaded garbage collection, which V8 does not. Um, so we moved all the code off the heap, turned it into its own space, introduced lots of new things, uh, and shared it across isolates where V8 was not able to do that before. Lots of refactoring, tons of work, months and months of work. Making the, the engine shared and the different also more work. Um, and then also now, one thing that I'm working on is the way array buffers work in JavaScript is completely foobarred across from me in V8. Um, unfortunately, that's on camera now. But yes, it is completely foobarred. <laughs> and I'm fixing it, so that would be months and months of work. OK, so all of this. Engine stuff, completely invisible. It's all magic. Like, no, like you would not know that we exist. Um, but on top of that, you have to do the work so that you do know that we exist. All these new features for, for WebAssembly um, that are done or almost done, including a set of atomic bytes so that you can write threaded code for WebAssembly. Uh, implementing tail calls on top of WebAssembly, two new bytes, those are relatively easy to implement. Exceptions were mentioned before. We actually have bulk memory proposal, which we've implemented, which has memcopy as a bytecode in WASM. It's the most beautiful thing. This is what I've always wished for in x86 is memcopy. You just do the thing the fast. <laughs> Turns out, it actually uh, is worthwhile, performance-wise, to, to implement that. Uh, multiple return values and multiple values within uh, ifs and blocks and things like that. We implemented that years ago. Um, but it's not gotten to the point where another engine has implemented it so it can be standardized and it doesn't have a JS uh, API service, but we implemented that. And then also reference types, so you can have opaque references that flow through WebAssembly code. You can't store them in memory, but you can put them in tables and use them in, as arguments and locals and things like that. That means you can interact with the JavaScript without using some indirection through some side tables where your integers are. Um, so you don't need memory. And <laughs> yeah, so I'm um, compiling for a bunch of programming language like that, and I'm pretty much excited about the tape calls coming up, and I've been trying to follow this proposal a bit. And you just said it is actually easy to implement, so maybe could you say a few more sentences of the, the proposal of tape calls? Yeah. Um, yeah. So in WebAssembly, without tail calls, there are two call bytecodes. One is call direct, where you give a function index. That's statically bound, and one is called indirect, where you actually get a dynamic index, which is into a table. And for the tail call proposal, there are just tail call versions of that. I think they call return call or something like that. Um, and they're basically, they do the same thing exactly, except that they eliminate the call response. And that's the only difference. That's the only difference. So they were easy to implement because TurboFan already had tail call support because we implemented it for JavaScript years ago. Even though tail calls of JavaScript are not really a thing because they kind of got screwed up. Um, 
the functionality was still there at the compiler. We use that for internal things to remove some of our built-in frames and things like that. Um, so it's relatively easy to, to make that work in, in uh, B. And what about other engines? Are they blocking the robot to the calls? No, it's mostly prioritization. Yeah, everybody's on board with uh, the design. It's just these two bytecodes. It's really nice and simple. It's explicit, which is great. And that was where a lot of the argumentation was in the JavaScript. Yeah, the big questions. So I have a question about changes to the source language parameters, and, and this occurred to me when you talked about the hints. So those hints are presumably about third by person, about clang or something that we modified yeah. uh, to generate those. Um, I'm curious what that involves. <laughs> what that involves? Yeah. So uh, just solve the whole thing problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, uh, yeah. the, the intern must have done something. <laughs> right. What the intern did is he actually wrote, uh, he used a genetic algorithm and let it run over the weekend on his workstation and found an optimal thing for some benchmark so that he could show that his internship was worthwhile. <laughs> um, but uh, the idea is that eventually tooling will integrate this okay. so that you can do a profiling run and it will just adjust the sections and uh, put it in there. Are you joking about the genetic algorithm? No, I don't think. It was something, I mean, it's a huge size right? Yeah. Right? It's like three to the end or something, right? Um, but no, I, I, I think that about the best. Yeah, yeah. And he was able to, I think he actually used a, a WASM, a static WASM um, instrumental library, which apparently those things exist now, which is amazing, to inject the profile you needed to find out which functions were called and hot. Obviously, it would be better if the engine could do that for you collect those things and spit out the section for you. So there's some integration to do there. Do we have one more quick question? So I see your end. Is it? Oh. Um, you reached it in your... I think this is it. Yeah. Okay, do we have one quick question before we go for a break? Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering whether you, uh, on the other engines, some of those issues, they must be facing some of those issues regarding compilation and start up time and all that stuff. Is there any exchange with the folks that you consider those things? Yeah, actually, we talked to them a lot. Actually, I consider them all my friends. Um, <laughs> uh, it's funny that you should mention, uh, well, you didn't mention that, but I'll mention that. So, one of Jan's other students works at Apple and is the main. A tech lead of the GSC engine, and we actually talk a lot, and we talk about how their execution tiers work, and um, I can tell you, I know enough about how their engines work to tell you that we're all converging on similar solutions. So Firefox, they have two tiers, baseline compiler, and their optimized compiler. They were actually, they had a head start on this, and they actually had their, JIT, uh, their baseline JIT before we did. Um, JSC also has two tiers for WebAssembly, uh, but they both go through the same compiler and they turn off many of the same, many uh, pipeline passes. There's probably not as big of a compilation time difference in those two tiers as, in, as the others, um, but I'm, it's probably still a 3x type of view. Um, yeah, I think Google probably has a little bit more in terms of engineering and resources. Uh, I think uh, Phil's team is mostly focused on JavaScript. They do some way of to keep up, but they're not pushing the standards uh, ahead as far as we are. Okay, that's time for the school. Thank you.